My research interests uh, areas are mostly uh, they are at the convergence of environmental biotechnology and decontamination. So the decontamination part or the contaminants part, you can say it originates from my chemistry love. So, <laughs> you know, okay. I yes. try to understand the fate and transport of contaminants and that puts me into perspective in understanding the right technology which can now the, treat these contaminants in the complex matrices. That is that. And environmental biotechnology is, like I said, during my, um, you know, learning journey, uh, microbiology intrigued me. And, and I, I, I understand more and more, I'm still learning, that it can really play a vital role in many of those, you know, um, treatment systems. And you are also doing some of them, you understand. So environmental biotechnology is helping me advance the the. the industrial microbiology aspect, you can okay. say, in terms of um, environmental engineering. Yes. Yeah, so, and uh, <clears throat> nowadays there are a, a lot of trends and focus on the recession. They can see that you are doing quite well in this, uh, increasing the, the value <laughs> added product that we recover either mm -hmm. from residues or wastes mm -hmm. or, can you explain, uh, uh, a layman language, mm -hmm. what does it mean that is increasing the value addition of residues? Okay, um, in a layman's language, if I have to explain, I would say, for example, let's say, let's consider food waste. Yes. Okay, that's a very basic thing I think everybody would understand. So food waste, when we talk about food, it has, uh, it provides us nutrition. So it has so many nutrients in it, yes. okay? Uh, again, in the layman's language, it has carbohydrates, it has proteins, it has fats or lipids, um, whatever we want to call it, or oils, okay? And now this is, what is, uh, the food is food to us as humans, it is also food to the microorganisms. Yes. So now the, f the food waste, what we call as waste, is not a waste, it's a resource. So that food waste becomes a food residue and now it can be fed to the microorganisms. The microorganisms can, or they can feed on it, use it as a nutrient source and transform it into something else. Because each microorganism is like a factory, you know, okay. so it can, it can take the food waste as a, as a substrate, as a raw material, and transform it into something else which is more uh, value added. So that's the path of uh, value addition. I hope I tried to explain yeah, it. I, I, like, I like that expression of <laughs> uh, explaining the, the biomass or the microorganisms as a factory. Mm -hmm. That you are feeding the substrate and then you are producing something. Correct. And maybe that's why you are calling them bio product yeah it's coming exactly from biological. coming from biological yes. system yeah. yeah and i think that the, there are a lot of effort towards mm -hmm. um, enhancing those technologies for um, recovering value added products from wastes or residues mm -hmm. so what are the cutting edge technologies on that sector nowadays hmm. uh, the cutting edge technologies like if i have to Say here in the Canadian perspective, for example, let's consider we have a lot of lignocellulosic material, the residues in the forest. You know, uh, the pulp and paper mills have sawdust. Uh, even the timber industry has a uh, lot of uh, waste. Even otherwise, you know, the infested wood lying yes. around in the, in the forest is a waste, so-called waste <clears throat> or a residue. So uh, taking up these lignocellulosic residues and uh, again, microorganisms feeding on them through fermentation and transforming them into enzymes, okay? Enzymes, again, being, uh, you know, catalysts. Yes. Interesting catalysts for many kind of chemical reactions, even in chemical synthesis, or even in the degradation of many contaminants, if we still stick around in the environmental field. So that is something which I would call as cutting edge. 
as well as I would say that using some of these, uh, like I know uh, some researchers, they are using these ways, the lignocellulosic, trying to separate the lignin. And now lignin is spraying, you know, used either in the pharmaceutical industry or in some other way uh, to make polymers. Okay, and as a biopolymer, lignin is being treated. So these are certain things I think which is going to be cutting edge and as well as we all know the meatless meat story, right? So, you know, growing, growing meat yeah. <laughs> rather, okay, on the petri. So that is also another advanced biotechnology though I'm not there, but I'm just saying that is, that is one classic bad. example. Yeah. Yeah, but okay. So there is always a, a challenge regarding those, I would say, the uh, biological process for converting the residues or the uh, biomass or the waste into a value-added mm. product, which is the economy of those technologies. Mm. So that's what we always say, okay, it is not economically visible. What was the argue for that? Is it economically visible? Some of those technologies are economically visible or no? It needs to have the government support and um, subsidies. Definitely, the government subsidies, <coughs> like they have provided in biodiesel, you know, is a, is another yes. good example. Is very important having policies around it. Like, let's take again the example of lignocellulosic in Brazil. Since the 1970s, they have had this bioethanol. It's nothing new, okay? But in North America, it has never picked up. It, the, it starts, loses ground, and then again starts, restarts, and again loses ground somehow. So that means the government support is not there in terms of, otherwise in terms of technology, it's not something, you know, which needs something extra than what Brazil is doing. Yeah. Brazil is also producing bioethanol from lignocellulosic residues, and we also have lignocellulosic residues here in Canada. Yeah. So e economy uh, normally for any of these bioproducts comes through like in a petroleum refinery. You need to have a biorefinery approach. Yes. So all the side streams need to be uh, in some way if possible valorized or circled back into the, into the same stream so that, uh, you know, it, no product ends up anywhere. And of course, nowadays people are also doing the LCCA that's a good concept, yeah. which is being done around many of these uh, technologies, which I think sort of helps place these uh, technologies in the cost and environmental context. You mentioned to biorefinery. Mm -hmm. So how is the biorefinery concept um, being advanced to maximize the value addition? Um, Okay, biorefinery is maximized through, uh, you know, sort of any side stream, which is maximum, uh, like in terms of volume or in terms of concentration of a particular uh, product, then that is being fed into another stream. Okay, give me, let me, let me tell you an example. For example, um, you know, uh, we have the lignocellulosic based biorefinery. So in, in the lignocellulosic biorefinery, sometimes the cellulose uh, also comes out, uh, still says, stays uh, undegraded, unused. So then that cellulose can be moved towards nanocellulose. And we all know okay. the applications of nanocellulose Nano. are vast. Yes. Pharmaceuticals, you know, they really need uh, okay. The nano, That's... we know NCC, nanocrystalline cellulose, right? So that is just one example, but you can likewise have many others. Like I spoke to you about lignin. Yep. So lignin is now even touted as for batteries. They are thinking if it could be, you know, used even for making batteries. That's something mm. which is uh, probably utopian at this point, <laughs> but <laughs> the, you, you know, the research know, yes. is advancing yes. towards that. Yes. Yeah. So... We keep talking about the, mostly the substrate now. Mm -hmm. We give a good example of substrates like the lignocellulosic material or the food waste. And then we have that factory of the mm -hmm. or bacteria or microorganisms mm -hmm. in general to produce our, what we call it, bioproducts. Mm -hmm. 
Can you give us some examples of the bioproducts? Okay. Uh, yes, I think, uh, again here, I can go back probably to my first <laughs> valuable experience as a okay. faculty, you know. Uh, uh, we had, uh, there is this um, in Quebec uh, province, and they are the largest producers even in Canada. Uh, they produce apple juice, La Sonde. Okay. You might have heard about, it's a company. It's not our no, song. Not, not, not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Genie. So they, uh, I, I did not know this problem until I met them. That's what I try to inculcate into students as well. That whenever we meet the stakeholders, you should learn more from them and yes. ask them questions. Because sometimes they know better than us what are their problems. Right. So likewise, in this case, we went to the plant and they showed us around how the juice is produced and everything. And they took us to the right at the beginning where the apples are processed. You know, they are crushed and the juice is extracted, filtered and so on. Yeah. So they told us that 30% of the solid apple is a waste. Okay. And it yes. contains seeds, uh, some amount of pulp, okay, yeah. some peel. And there is no value for it because it's sugar. They say they give it to the farmers. Farmers, if they desire it, they take it. But it's sugar. It gets putrefied by the time they transport it to their farm yeah, and feed it. Yeah, very quick. Yeah. And even for animals, it's just sugar. It's no <laughs> high value. So they asked us if we could think of something. So um, uh, since we have been we had been working on environmental biotechnology, so we thought maybe we can convert it into fungal protein, and then it could be used in animal feed. So we transformed it there. That's where the mini circular economy, if I have to put it rightly, was okay. done. We brought the apple substrate. We fermented in solid waste to make fungi, to grow fungi, made the fungal protein. And after you extract the fungi, fungus, you're still left with the residue, which is yeah. digested now. Now that residue, then we had collaborations with the um, research uh, development lab in agriculture who had experimental farms and we fed it to the animals and there was a significant weight gain in f almost, mm. uh, I think, two months, um, 3.5 times weight gain oh. when that hydrolyzed biomass was fed to them. To the animal. To the animal. So because it is hydrolyzed, and now there is some residue protein remaining mm, from yeah, that because fungi, yes. you're not able to extract the entire fungus, yes. right? 20% might still remain. And there were some <laughs> enzymes. So it, it helped them reduce some metals they were adding to protect their immunity. So it oh, really had okay. a cascading impact. It was learning, really learning curve for us also to understand how it can all go. Okay. So there ends the cycle, you know, the enzymes. And if we, if they, the fungal protein can go to the animal feed industry, they can mix it with animal feed yes. because they want protein in the, um, in the feed industry. And uh, if there were certain enzymes, they can be circulated back into the, into the plant itself for clarifying the juice. Because yeah. you, we know that there are some juices, they have more cloud or haze. Uh, yeah. And there are other juices which are clear. So the ones that are clear, they normally use ultrafiltration. Oh. But you can replace ultrafiltration by enzymes.